Hello and welcome to another video. I'm Alistair Cook and we're looking today at some more Cohesity, in particular the Cohesity REST API. I've written a little bit about the developer resources and the ability to interact with your Cohesity cluster programmatically. Uh, today I want to look some more at the REST API that's provided by my Cohesity cluster. So here it is, here's my cluster that we've seen for a while. It's still running fairly highly utilized, it's running a fair number of uh, protections, but what we want to look at is the REST API, and the quickest way to the get, get to the REST API is off this help button here, and just hitting the REST API uh, link. Now this takes us to the API Explorer. I've already authenticated to the cluster, and what we'll see is when we're using this directly from a uh, tool, and in our case I'm going to be using the API directly from Python, uh, we'll see that authentication is really important to us, and we must first do this access token part in here. Now this REST API interface here is, is a Swagger interface that allows us to see what APIs are available, what methods are available, and then also see what parameters those methods require, and even try out some of those methods along the way. So it's incredibly useful to have this user interface on top of the cluster itself. In addition to that, there's the Cohesity developer portal on developer.kcd.com, which has more documentation. And in, in there, there's documentation about the Python language bindings for the Cohesity API. Now, you can use those language bindings directly and not have to actually write all of the REST calls, but I'm going to be actually directly calling the REST API from my Python command, uh, command prompt and working that way through the API because it's a more generic solution. Uh, the language bindings that are available on the developer portal are Python and PowerShell, and that's, that's it. From there on, if, if you're using anything else, you have to be talking to the API directly. So I'm going to talk to the API directly uh, using Python I'm using Python because I'm familiar with it more than that, that you'd necessarily use Python normally. So we'll pop back and forwards between here and the Cohesity REST API documentation and a console. And where's that console gone? Here it is. So console on my Mac, uh, it's on the same network as my Cohesity cluster. And I'm going to be running most things inside Python uh, shell, but before I do that, I do need to add to my Python the um, module, that's the, the library that allows me to run REST calls. So I'm going to paste in this pip install requests. Uh, well, that's failed, hasn't it? Because I haven't done it with a sudo. Elevate my privileges with sudo uh, and then install the requests module so the package is successfully installed. And then I just start the Python interpreter. Uh, I like Python for some of the same reasons that I like PowerShell. It's uh, object-oriented, it's uh, able to be used interactively to debug your scripts, and you don't have to uh, keep rerunning scripts and compiling. It's very quick for developing. So I'm going to start with uh, importing both requests. So import requests that I just installed, uh, and I'm also going to import uh, JSON so that I've got some way of handling JSON text. And I'm going to set an environment, a, a, set a variable for the IP address of my cluster because I'm going to use that again. And um, then I'm going to start using the API directly. So the first thing I, I want to do is that uh, access tokens. And so if we pop back into here, we can see that there is a, a path for this particular endpoint on the API is this, this public access tokens. And if I choose in here that I want to try it out, I can put in some values that have to be passed. So this is a post method, which means send data in and uh, retrieve data back. So the domain in here is going to be local. And then the username and password are both the default admin. And once I've got those two set, I can say just go and execute it. That lets me see what kind of data is going to actually be sent and what data is going to come back again. So on here I particularly see, particularly see this uh, data that's being sent in the post. This is where the authentication is actually being sent in, this minus D, and then I've got to have this uh, escaped quote around domain and local and password. So there's a 
chunk of formatting of data in there. There is also the uh, URI, well, it's listed down here as, as the URL. Uh, there is the um, URL that's being accessed to post this data in, and we need this in particular because I've got an environment variable for the cluster IP address. I just need this part that follows the cluster IP address. So if I pop back through to my command prompt, find the right window, there it is. Uh, so I've got my cluster IP. What I'm going to do is fill out the actual URI of my request and it looks like this. Alright, so my request URI is now constructed. Uh, if I just echo, oops, got caps lock on somewhere along the way. Alright, pass out a request URI. You can see now it's the same as the URL that was specified in the API documentation. Alright, then I need to actually run that request. So if I pop into here, the actual request that I'm going to run. So the request is that line, and it says requests, which is our uh, REST API handling tool, post to the, the URI that I've specified in the variable above, and then the data here that I want to post in is that domain, local, password, admin, username, admin. Uh, very importantly at the end, verify false. That means I am not going to check the certificate of my cluster because I don't have a trusted certificate sitting on my Cohesity cluster. Uh, consequently, I get some messages back here saying that this is going to be an insecure request. You really shouldn't do this. Um, yes, absolutely agree. I should actually have a uh, certificate on this, this cluster. Uh, so I get a, a response, so token uh, response, where are we? Token response is the variable that I've populated. The token response is an object rather than just a single variable. So token response is telling me there was a, a response of 201, which is a success. If I look at the text that was returned, we can see quite a bit more in here. And we can particularly see at the beginning, we have this access token and the long string of letters and numbers that are my access token. That's what I really wanted to generate. And so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to extract out that access token from my response. So the variable is called token response. And if I trim out of it, you know, paste in the separator to trim out just the access token, you can see that we get the access token back. It is formatted a little bit funkily, so I do an encode it with ASCII and get the, the value back out. So I populate a variable again, paste that guy in. Uh, so now I have token is a variable that just contains the text of my access token. Now the access token by itself isn't terribly useful. I need to pass it in the forthcoming request as a part of the request. So I do this by having a header with authorization in it and pasting that token into the, the header. So just put together a string and if I now show that, that variable Headers is a string containing authorization specifying that it's a bearer token and has the actual token in it. Every time I make a request against the API now, I'm going to need to pass in that set of headers, that variable as the headers, and that will then use the same token, that bearer token, all the way through. So that's cool. Uh, that gets me authentication. And then if I pop back into here, I want to, to solve a couple of problems or illustrate a couple of things in here. The first thing I thought of to illustrate was to talk about capacity and have a, a way of analyzing the capacity in my cluster and returning some data around that to return some information about how full my cluster is. So somewhere down here we'll find a stats area of the API. If I roll down uh, restore tasks, scheduler, search, statistics, stats. And there is in here stats on all kinds of uh, objects or all kinds of entities, uh, protection runs, last runs, protection summary. I want to look at the storage stats. 
So in here we've got storage stats for my entire cluster. If I say I want to try it out, we can just go run, execute the API call. Uh, it's, it's just on this one endpoint. Well, we can see the endpoint more clearly down here in the request URL. And then it returns just the storage uh, stats for my cluster. You can see that there's data around the different elements, uh, file services, data protection, and also the capacity and uh, usage inside my cluster is all returned here in the return JSON. If I want to go and pop that into a request, now I can paste in the URI again, so going again through that stats storage path and then doing the request and again passing the headers so that I've got the authorization. Right. As before, I get an insecure request warning, but um, that's not a concern for me. Did I get my response back? Yes, I got a 200 success response. Uh, and if I look at that, uh, the body as JSON, I got some information back and you can see it's the same information local um, data protection usage, total usage, file services, those kinds of things. So my response variable does contain those, those values that I want. So one of the things I want to do is populate a couple of new variables. So if I populate a, a variable called capacity bytes, this is going to be my total capacity of my cluster. So capacity bytes is populated. And let's have a look at the value. Paste that back in, capacity bytes says, yep, I've got some bytes. Now I've declared it as a float so that when I do division, I get a floating response. I'm also going to specify the uh, used bytes as, um, as a float. And again, I'm just extracting this out of the JSON that was returned by the, um, the, the request. So if I have uh, used bytes in here, I've got used bytes, I've got capacity, so if I then divide used bytes by capacity bytes, uh, I get some variable, or some value, uh, and I can convert that easily into a percentage by multiplying it by 100. So I can do my capacity utilization, nice and easy, paste that in, and now my utilization says I'm at 83%. Uh, I cast it into an integer to just trim off all, everything after the decimal point. So now I know the percentage capacity utilization on my cluster from a very quick set of API calls. I can do a little bit of math with that and I can paste in some, some tests. So in this block of text, I just say if utilization is less than 85%, then print out that storage utilization is okay. If it's not less than 85%, then throw out a warning. So my current utilization at 83% is below my threshold for utilization. Everything seems to be okay. I could have multiple clusters and talk to multiple clusters this way. I could pop this all in, into a um, text file. I could take some other action on this. Uh, I could even use this as part of my decision about which of my Cohesity clusters should be protecting some resource in my environment, although most often you're probably just going to have a single large cluster in each location. Next thing that I wanted to look at now that I know that my storage utilization is okay is to see if all of the virtual machines on my vSphere platform are protected. And so one of the things I want to do then is, is go through and pop back into the into the API Explorer and see if I can find something about protection stats. So back up here somewhere, you can see that there's a really extensive set of APIs in here. And I was looking at the protection jobs and was going to use a get protection jobs. So get protection jobs is going to return me some data about all of the protection jobs. Let's try it. Let's see if we can do that, something really simple. Let's just say I only want to get a report about protection jobs that run against VMware. I'll, it'll warn me if I need any of those other variables. Run the API command and here it is. Here's the endpoint. We've got a query on here that says just the environment VMware. And here is a return of the backup jobs that are protecting VMware. If I ran that same thing and I didn't 
do the VMware selection. So I turn off the VMware selector and then run that. It's going to show me everything that's protected in my environment. And as we see down here in the, the result, um, there are backups of a variety of different things in here. We've got VMware backups in here. We've got um, NAS backups in here. We've got replication. We've got multiple different types. This is why I did want to use that filter and just filter for the VMware backup jobs because I only have a single VMware backup job in my environment and it looks after backing up a bunch of virtual machines. One of the things we can't see though is the actual names of the virtual machines. All we get is the source IDs in here. And so we get a variety of source IDs ret returned by that get protection jobs. So let's just run that uh, get protection jobs and see what we get back. So here we go, copy that, put back into my prompt here. Again, I populate out a URL for URI for the request and at the end you can see there's that query with the environments VMware and then just do the get of the response and again use those headers that contain the authentication. Uh, then let's see what we got back, copy that, paste it in, again got a 200. Now if we don't want JSON formatted we can just look at the text of the actual response body and here's our response body. So it does contain all of our backups, uh, all of our protection jobs that are for VMware, we only have one and very importantly we want to look at these source IDs. So there's a bunch of uh, IDs of virtual machines. I need to turn that into the names of the virtual machines. What we wanted to look at instead was protection sources. Uh, wherever protection sources has gone. There we go, protection sources for a particular object ID. This is the one where when I try it and I post in an, a virtual machine ID, then I get some data back about the particular virtual machine and in particular the name of the virtual machine that is protected. So this is the API call I need in order to translate those uh, object IDs into the names of my virtual machines. So I already have a source response variable populated and what I need to do is to use that variable and s iterate through every protection job in the source because I don't, but other environments you will have multiple protection jobs for your VMware source and then iterate through all of the IDs and build up a list of every source ID uh, that needs to be, that, that is in, in uh, corresponds to a protected virtual machine. But rather than just getting the source IDs, I'm going to go through, so for job in source response gives me all the jobs and then within each job I go for the IDs in that job. Go and do a request for the object whose object ID matches up and then pull out of that the name of the virtual machine that is protected. So this nesting of, of loops makes sure that I'm going to go through and get a protected VMs list that contains the name of every virtual machine that's protected by every VMware protection job on my cluster. Right, and you can see again lots of warnings about this, uh, running these insecure uh, methods and the result though is that I have a protected VMs list containing the name of every virtual machine that's in a backup, uh, in a protection job on my vSphere environment and you can see that I've got what, eight virtual machines, six virtual machines that are protected there. So now I've got my list of virtual machines that are protected by protection jobs. I need to create a list of all of the virtual machines that are on my vCenter service. So there is a protection sources section in here and that includes a list of virtual machines. So here it is, protection sources, virtual machines. If I want to try it, I can just say go and execute that. And then we have an endpoint here and it has a list of virtual machines and I can see the name of the virtual machines that are protected here. 
Okay, so I need this protected uh, protection sources virtual machines. The funny thing is that this virtual machines protection sources endpoint uh, only covers virtual center service. So apparently, if you have um, non VMware virtual machines, well, we're not going to show up in here. Uh, happily, all of my environment is VMware at the moment. So let's go in and create ourselves that request, get our response back, make sure that our response came back as our 200, good, and have a look at the text inside it, make sure that we have a list of virtual machines, so we've got good data back. Now I'm going to start a couple of variables, uh, one is a list of the virtual machines that are not protected, and that will start out empty, but I'm also going to populate in a list of virtual machines that I don't want to try and protect, so these unprotectable virtual machines, and particularly my Cohesity Virtual Edition appliance shouldn't be trying to pack it, back itself up. And I've got another virtual machine that has recreatable disposable data in it. So I populated those two variables, now I'm going to iterate through that response code with our list of all of the known virtual machines, and if it's not in either my protected or unprotectable virtual machines list, I'm going to add it to the unprotected virtual machines list. Okay, so I'm going to extract just the name out of that list of virtual machines, and if it's not in either of my lists, protected or unprotectable, then I'll add it to the unprotected VMs list. Away we go, and that's done if we take our unprotected VMs list, uh, copy that and paste it in here. Uh, we get two virtual machines and I can see that when I upgraded my VCSA from 6.5 to 6.7 it's no longer protected because of course it's a completely new virtual machine as you do the upgrade process and I really do need to change the protection job to protect my VCA 6.7 that's now deployed out. Well it was fairly simple really to get a report of how much capacity I have free, what the utilization is on my cluster, as well as getting some details of which virtual machines in my inventory are not protected. Fairly easy to get directly from the API, of course it's probably simpler to do this through the PowerShell SDK or uh, the PowerShell module or the uh, Python SDK, but they're limited to specific languages. Lots of fun here, um, we've got lots of data out of my Cohesity cluster using the API, and as we have a look through it, there's a huge number of uh, API calls that are available th through here. Uh, lots and lots of really useful things. I particularly like this export config option, the option to export out a uh, complete config for your Cohesity cluster has got to be nice and useful huge number of different items that you can manipulate through the API here. Uh, and that's that's how you want things to be. You don't have to work through the API, of course I mostly work through the GUI, but absolutely API is available to us as well as those language bindings. So I'm Alistair Cook, stay tuned here for more videos around Cohesity as I learn about more of the aspects, and let me know on Twitter as DemitasNZ if there's particular things you'd like to know about Cohesity if you'd like me to look at.